Hi there and welcome to my home again. And I really appreciate you for watching these videos, whether you watch them live, like right now, um, as I'm doing it, or whether you watch them later, I want you to know they're available permanently. I put them on my YouTube channel after I'm done here. And I really appreciate your input, your feedback, because it's only through your feedback that I can get better and better at this. And so I love hearing your questions. Even if I don't get to your questions today, I do read through them and then I do use them for future videos. Even if I don't directly address your question, I do integrate what you say into what I'm talking about. So your feedback always helps. So thank you so much for that. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to, for you just to say, hey, and tell me where you're from. But today's topic, I wanted to speak a little bit more about sensitivity and empathy. Um, and so today's topic is sensitive is the new strong. So actually I'm currently writing my third book. Um, and for those of you who haven't read my first and second book, I would suggest you read them because you get a lot more about what I'm about and what I'm talking about and where my information comes from and about my own journey through cancer and, and facing death and so on. So um, I often feel that because I literally had to die to really learn how to live, this is what drives me to share this information. I don't want people to have to go through what I went through. I want to save them that pain and that heartache that I went through. I want to save their families that heartache that I put my family through. Um, and this is why I share it. So um, the topic of today's video is Sensitive is the New Strong. And that is also the title of my third book, which I am currently writing. And I was someone who was extremely sensitive. I was or am um, an empath. I don't think that you ever stop being one. But what you do is you learn how to cope with it or deal with it. So I never knew that in the past. I always thought there was something wrong with me. But I was somebody who was super, super sensitive, um, very empathic. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. And today I want to explore that subject further and I want to talk about what I believe that people who relate to this need to know and what it was that turned me into a doormat and, and what it was that was my downfall and how to avoid it. So um, let's start with, uh, with a generalization of sensitivity and how it's perceived to be a weakness when I actually see it as a strength. So how many of you actually watch the news on TV and keep up with all the current affairs? I used to, but I've stopped doing it because it's too crazy for me. I can't take it. If you watch the news, you wouldn't be faulted for believing that we are on the brink of our own extinction. I mean, just look at everything they report on, all the shootings, the killings, and, and, and everything that's going on in politics and the way people rip each other apart and speak about each other. If you're someone who's super sensitive and empathic, it really affects you. It really, when you're an empath or super sensitive, things feel larger than life, almost exaggerated in your heart and in your mind and you find it hard to cope with it. I call it sensory overload. So you actually find it really hard to cope with those emotions. So even if somebody is saying, to, even if people say to me, how can you avoid the news and don't bury your head in the sand and you're not being realistic, I can't help it. I do it for my own survival. I cannot watch the news. Every now and then I will just watch something that's more um, neutral something that gives me the headlines or what's happening globally. But I cannot take the day-to-day -day incessant reporting of the news. It's just too much for me. So here's the problem is that, uh, that I believe that we're having with the world right now. And so this is just my view. Um, I believe that up to a certain point, you know, uh, it was good to be uh, to define strength the way we have defined it up to now. Um, evolution has brought us this far because of our beliefs that might is right or kill, kill or be killed or, um, you know, that strength is measured in brute force. 
And we needed it years ago. And evolution has brought us this far with that belief. But right now, we're on the precipice of something where if we continue like this, we are on the brink of our own extinction. That's what I believe anyway. And so in order to take us to the next level of evolution, we need to start embracing sensitivity as a strength and not as a weakness. We need to redefine what strength is. So up until now, we have seen sensitivity as a weakness. You know, people say, good guys finish last. And if you're super sensitive, they say, um, grow a thicker skin. Or if you're a guy, they say, man up and boys don't cry. And you need to be stronger. You need stronger boundaries. And, uh, and we, see it, it, we, we see that the world makes it, our paradigm makes it really hard for sensitive people to make it to the top. And this is why we say, good guys finish last. And, uh, and we see it very hard for sensitive people or empathic people to take on leadership roles. This is what we need to change if we want to see the next stage of evolution in our planet. This is really what we need to change. So um, I actually believe that this way of thinking, although it brought us this far, this is what is actually wrong with our world right now. And so, um, let me tell you some of the things that I want, uh, that I feel that empaths and sensitive people need to know to help them navigate this terrain that we're in right now. So number one, I want to tell you, if you're an empath, if you're a super sensitive person, in other words, if you're relating to what I'm saying, that you can't watch the news and it's affecting you, you feel that you you physically feel it in your body when things are uh, painful and sad. You feel the emotions of the people around you. You empathize to the point where you almost feel it's your own emotions. You take on the weight of the world. Then if you relate to these things, then you're an empath. Um, so what I want to tell you is that your inner world is really strong, really, really strong. Your connection to your higher self, if you are an empath or you're someone who's super sensitive, but you forget that because you allow the outer world to overpower you. An empath is somebody who straddles two worlds. They feel the feelings of everything in this physical world, and they feel that connection with their higher self really strongly. And because you straddle two worlds, and this is important for you to know, because you straddle two worlds, you sometimes get lost in one or the other. This is why many spiritual, um, teachers, not, not necessarily teachers, many um, really people who are really connected with the other world feel the need to leave this one and they go to ashrams and they go up to mountaintops. But for some reason, many of us are meant to be here and immerse ourselves in this physical world. And if you're someone who's meant to be here, if you have family keeping you here, if you have children, if you have spouses, loved ones, and you know that you can't leave here you need and you need to be here it's important for you to know that you do straddle two worlds and when you feel heavy burdened lost it's because you are becoming too immersed in this physical world and the problems of the physical world that you are forgetting your connection with the other world you see in truth what we are what we are able to do is we are able to change this paradigm by bringing our connection from the other world into this one, by bringing that light, by shining that light. But what ends up happening is because we feel we carry the weight of this world, we end up becoming bogged down by the darkness and we end up becoming part of the darkness instead of bringing our light into the world. And that's a mistake that we end up very often making and that's why I want to remind you that you need to recharge if you're an empath you need to recharge you need to connect to the other side you need to know that it's not your imagination and don't let people tell you it's your imagination don't let people tell you you're delusional because remember people told me I was delusional because I learned this when I was on the other side death actually taught me who I was and when I came back, I realized that
that I had this strong connection. I'm not the only one. All of you tuning in do. That's why you resonate with my work. You have your own strong connection. You don't need someone to tell you what to believe or not believe. You have this direct connection. And so um, we can call it what we want. We can call it God. We can call it the inner mystic. Uh, we can call it whatever resonates with you. But when I started to realize and believe in this connection, that's when my life started to work. And when I would talk to people about it, people in my paradigm, people who had different ideas of what it meant to be strong and successful and leaders, when I would tell them my feelings, um, I was made to feel that I was delusional. So I literally had to step away from all that and discover my own reality, my own truth, and live my own truth. And only in doing that was I able to get from there to where I am today. And today, those same people that made me feel I was delusional, they come back into my life and they say, oh my gosh, how have you done what you're doing? I love your life. I love what you're doing. I envy you. How can I get to where you are? And I tell them, you just have to be delusional. So remember, if this world has labeled what you are and what you do as delusional, don't worry about it. You need to do what you need to do to connect with your inner self. And that is your gift. That is your strength. Your downfall, your curse is your, um, your empathy for everybody and everything around you. And this is why we often feel that we have, we're carrying this burden, but you need to place more importance on charging your batteries because you are needed as someone to bring that side here as someone who carries the light, not someone who becomes part of the problem and part of the drama and part of the mess. So that's number one that you need to do. So you need to know, and you need to know that it's not selfish to take care of yourself. Hence my t-shirt, love yourself like your life depends on it, because it does. For me, that was a very expensive lesson that took, almost took my life. And that's why I'm here sharing it with you. Um, and you really need to feel that it's not selfish. And people will say, yes, but there are people suffering and dying. Yes, but if you're suffering and dying, you cannot help them. You need to love yourself and take care of yourself and take care of your own connection and do whatever it takes, even if other people label you as selfish. So that's number one. Number two is people who are super sensitive, super empathic, you actually need to be a little bit selective about who you choose to follow, spiritual teachers and so on. And I wouldn't even be offended if you didn't follow me because you need to honor who you are inside. It's not about what I say. I'm not asking you to follow me or believe in me. I'm asking you to believe in you. And the reason why I say to be selective is because um, people who are empaths are attracted to spirituality like moths to a flame because you feel it soothes you, it feeds you. But at the same time, because you're attracted to it, not all the spiritual messages um, are right for you. Not all of them empower you. Some of them may make you feel small and demeaned. You need to go for spiritual messages that empower you. And people who are empaths, um, when you follow spiritual messages that tell you to always be of service, it's better to give than to receive. Um, it's that the ego is bad. You have to diminish your ego. Those messages are fine messages. They're great messages for the world at large. But here's the thing. If you're someone who's already making yourself small, if you're someone who's already putting yourself last, if you're someone who's already feeling burdened by the problems of the world, the last thing you need to hear is that I need to go out and serve them and put myself last and drain myself and make myself small and, um, and, and squash my ego. Because those very messages are the ones that made me feel drained and tired to the point that I got cancer. They made me feel so small and they dimmed my light. Those messages turned me into a doormat. Again, I wanna say those are fine messages. They're great messages for the world at large, but they're not for everyone. They're not for somebody 
who is already a doormat, somebody who doesn't know how to receive, who's giving and giving. My message is for you, if that's in your category. My message is not for people who are already out there receiving and um, doing their thing and telling people what to do. My message is for you, the one who was the downtrodden doormat, the one who took on everybody's problems, the one who drained themselves, the one who didn't know how to receive. You need to know how to empower yourself. You need to know how to connect. You need to know how to get in touch with your own um, inner guru, your own, um, your own line to God, whatever you want to call it. You need to feel empowered so that you can shine your light in the world. You straddle two worlds and the world needs you. My message is for you if you resonate with that. And so, so number two was just be, um, you need to be discerning or selective as to what spiritual messages that you follow. And be aware that if you are somebody who is a doormat, you have a tendency to give your power away to spiritual authorities. Remember, there is no greater authority than you for you. There is no greater authority than your own direct connection for what's right for you. So if the message makes you feel empowered, then it's for you. If it diminishes your light and it makes you feel small and it makes you feel less than, then it's not for you. Walk on. It's not the fault of the spiritual teacher, their message will resonate with someone else. Remember, there are many messages, there are many how-to books, many self-help books. But if you are a doormat, a people pleaser, an empath, a super sensitive person, you need messages that empower you. You need to know that you need to, um, that you have a connection to the divine that is as strong as any spiritual guru out there has, okay? That's what I want you to know. And you need to shine your light. So the number three, the third thing I want you to know is that chances are you're really good at giving of yourself because you've had a lot of practice. You've always believed that it's, um, that it's better to give than to receive. So you've spent a lifetime of giving and giving and giving and you're now drained and you think, but this is what I'm meant to do. This is what the teachings tell me. Why haven't I been rewarded yet? Why hasn't, it, uh, hasn't the breakthrough come for me yet? That's because your receiving channels aren't opened. You've been giving, but you don't know how to receive. So I want to remind you to open your receiving channels because when you give and give, just like a smartphone, when you drain the battery, you need to charge the battery. So look at it just as an energy exchange and in whatever way that revitalizes you, whether it means allowing people to give you a massage, whether it means spending your money on yourself and not giving it all away to charity, whatever it is. Because remember, the world needs you. We want you to be here longer. So when the world rewards you, when other people reward you, the world rewards you through other people giving you. So when you are getting those rewards, when you're getting things from other people, receive it. Those people are giving it to you in gratitude because they want you to be here. They want you here longer. So don't feel obligated when you receive. Don't feel um, guilty immediately. Like a lot of people, when they receive something, immediately they feel, oh my gosh, this is a burden. I have to repay them. Don't feel that. Imagine every time you gave someone a gift that they felt it was a burden. That's terrible. You would feel awful if you knew that every time you gave and gave and gave of yourself that people felt it was a burden. So you really have to open up to also receiving. Um, and it's, it's also, it's dishonest to give and give just because you want to score up karma points or because you spiritually believe it's better to give than to receive. You need for the giving to come from the overflowing. That is so much better. When you receive, when you charge your batteries and it overflows that you have so much energy, it's like, I don't need all of this energy. So you give and you can, and when you receive, because it's an energy flow, 
um, you are able to give continuously without ever feeling tired. I've actually done a video specifically on this and I think it was two or three weeks ago. Uh, please look back on some of my YouTube videos on the importance of receiving. This is so important because if you don't receive, you are even blocking your flow of giving. So number three, important to receive. Number four, people who are doormats, empaths, people pleasers. And I say this affectionately, even when I say doormat, I am not judging you because I'm speaking about myself. I was a doormat my whole life because I was conditioned to be that way. It still rears its head. It's really hard to change those old habits, even though I know I don't need to be one anymore. It rears its head only because I didn't learn any other way to be. So anyway, I say this to you affectionately because I'm one of you, you and I are the same. And if you are a people pleaser, doormat, empath, super sensitive, chances are you also have a lot of trouble making money. Um, and it could be from um, misperceptions that uh, money is the root of all evil. So I, wanna, I want you to look at your beliefs around money because this is really important because it's a myth that money, you know, a lot of you believe that money is not spiritual. That is a myth. And I'll tell you why. Because in the world that we currently live in, if you have been called to be part of this world and not go hide away in a mountaintop or an ashram or somewhere, and I know I am called to live in this world, in this world of duality, in this drama. That's why I was sent back. If I was meant to live remotely, I would have just stayed on the other side. And I know so many of you relate to what I'm saying. You're not, you're not here to live remotely. You're here to be in the thick of things, to bring your sensitivity, to bring your light into it. And if you're here for that reason, you, in order to pay our rents, put food on the table, go to the market, go to the grocery store, buy food, you need money. You need it to survive. So don't turn it away. And also um, don't criticize people who make money from doing spiritual work. We need them more. Um, and so in fact, reward them, um, give them credit for, for doing that. Because we live in a paradigm where it seems to be okay for Wall Street to make bazillions of dollars. But the minute a spiritual person earns or charges money for their work, we criticize them. Now here's the thing. I would rather an empath make money. You know why? Because chances are they're spending it on something that benefits not only themselves, absolutely themselves, but also the world. So I would much rather somebody who is super sensitive, who cares about the world, make a ton of money because they will be a better channel for the money than someone who lives in fear. And because greed, of course, comes from fear. Um, and it also comes from the belief that there isn't enough to go around. So if you find yourself angry at somebody who's making money, um, it's because you are, I want you to check into your beliefs and notice that it comes from a belief that there isn't enough to go around. Actually, there is. There is more than enough to go around. And if you're feeling empathy for the people who are starving, the poor people in the world, the people in third world countries, you're more able to help them when you allow yourself to be a channel that allows yourself to receive money. So remember, you have to receive money in order to be able to give it. And the other thing is the fact that spiritual people um, should not make money. That is actually a myth because even if you look at spiritual teachers or gurus who do not charge for their work, they rely on donations. They still need donations for the upkeep of their ashram or their temple or their food and their living and the people who work there. So the fact that spiritual teachers should not charge is actually a myth. And, uh, and I can tell you that it's, there is no virtue in being poor. And the more money I have, the more victorious I feel in changing this paradigm and in helping people to also find their flow of money. That's my aim is to have enough money to have a platform to help more and more people, to help more people who are, who are sensitive, who are empaths to stand up there and take on leadership roles. Um, so that was number four money. 
And the, the other thing I want to go back to with, um, uh, with, with the spiritual beliefs and the ego is that when you suppress your ego and you are somebody that is super empathic, sensitive, strong, who has really good ideas, um, you are reluctant to take leadership roles if you suppress your ego. But actually we need more people like that, more empaths, more sensitive people to actually take on leadership roles. So, um, you know, and so this is why I would love for them to embrace their egos and take on more leadership roles and be unafraid. So, and then the fifth and final one is to realize that your sensitivity is a gift. It's a gift. It's a strength. It's not a weakness. It's what the world needs right now. So shine your light as bright as you can. So thank you for tuning in and let's go to the questions. Danny, do we have any questions? You have a lot, a lot of comments coming in. In fact, you even have one from somebody who you might know, somebody oh, yeah? called Sunita Techchand. Oh, Sunita, my buddy, my buddy in Dubai. I love her. Love right. you. She has a simple quote. She has a simple message for you saying, so, so true. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. And. Uh, and thank you for following me. I know you share all my stuff. And so, so I wrote about Sunita in my first book, Dying to Be Me. It was her healing center that I went to and I spoke at where I had this shift. And it was while I was there in Dubai, which is where she is, that I got the email from Hay House saying Wayne Dyer had discovered my story. So thank you. <laughs> And Jenny Frost says, I love what you're teaching today. I feel strong. Yay. Vanessa says, food for my soul resonated fully at my heart level. Thank you. Anna Marie, excellent. When is coming this new book? It's coming next year and I'm working on it right now. I have a wonderful editor who's um, keeping me on track. And so coming out next year, um, and I, I personally feel really passionate about this subject and I think it's so needed in the world today. Cora says, how do you turn around from always giving to receiving? Great question. So it takes practice. So the first thing to do is to ask yourself, what would feel, what would reward me? You know, it's like, um, I would actually make a list of all the things that I have denied myself from doing that actually feel really good though. It could be something like um, I've spent my time, let's say, taking care of family or uh, I mean, this is not me, I'm just saying as an example, you may have spent your time going to work or taking care of family and all these things that you do that everything feels urgent and you put yourself last. So now I want you to think about what are all the things that I would do if I had time? If I suddenly had an extra hour every single day, what are the things I would do? And so I want you to make a list of these things. Um, if you can increase that to two hours over time, that's even better. And so it would be things like maybe t uh, go see a movie, binge watch on a TV series you've always wanted to watch, read a book, soak in a tub, go for a massage, go to a restaurant, enjoy a good dinner with fine wine, go out with friends, like literally make a list of everything that you would love to do. And in fact, if you think in terms of, oh my gosh, I've got this extra hour where I have no work, no obligations, nothing I have to do where I can do anything I want, what would I do? So make a list of all the things you would do. Then that's, that's number one. So you have this list. The next thing is to make a commitment to do at least one of those things. Maybe in the beginning, you can only squeeze an hour every two days, increase it to every day, increase it to two hours every day. And I promise you that your productivity will not go down. It will go up. You know why? Because when you receive, when you do something for yourself, when you gift yourself, what happens is you charge your batteries and you become more effective and you become more efficient in your work that you work smarter, faster. But here's the second thing that happens. You actually change your frequency. When you change that frequency, you start to notice different things. 
you start to resonate with different people and you will find that people are gifting you things because you'll start changing frequency means noticing different things at a different level and then and because you notice them you start operating at that level and this is what will start to happen where you will find that people are gifting you things every single day and things are just coming to you. Money's coming to you, free massages are coming to you and things are just coming to you. So, so the first thing to do, make a list of all the things you would do. Second thing to do, actually make the time to do it. As you start to get into the habit of doing it, the third thing will happen by itself. Your frequency will change and things will start coming to you. So hope that was clear. Thank you for that question. Martina says, I love your cheat sheet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great cheat sheet. And cheat sheet. And always keep more things than you can do on that list as a backup. You know, and any time, every day, when you have that hour, go through that list and say, okay, what do I feel like doing today? That is something that you can treat yourself with every day and something to look forward to. Noor Hana has a question, says, how do I deal with being an empath and having a job where I have to be a leader? Um, you know, it's a great opportunity. Don't hide that you're an empath. So the, I guess if you were in front of me, I would ask you, do you love your job or not? Do you hate your job? For an empath and for somebody who's super sensitive, it's really important for you to love your job. Uh, I know that's not always the case. That's because all the decisions and choices you've made up to this point were made from a place of not realizing how important it is. Very often, um, the guidance that we're given by well-meaning people around us, our community, our peers, possibly our parents, our teachers, our schools, the guidance leads us into taking um, the job or the career path that is the most financially lucrative. And I say financially lucrative in, co in quotes because it can also lead us out to burnout, which is not financially lucrative. In the long run, financially lucrative is something that feeds our soul. We have to reevaluate, just like we have to reevaluate what strength is, the new definition of strength has to encompass sensitivity, empathy, and all those things. The new definition of success also has to be defined and we have to change the hierarchy and success and at the top of success should not be money. You know, for me, money just gives me freedom. But for me, the top of success is really freedom, but also love, like having love, being surrounded by love, having people who love me, having people who I love being able to do what I love every single day and having enough money to have the freedom to do that. That to me is success. So we need to redefine success. And, um, and so your question about leadership, take it on and be who you are and be an inspiration. Leadership is something that should be done by inspiration and not by force. So you have an opportunity there to do that. So thanks for that question. Sue Dribben Dixon has a question that might dovetail into what you just said. Sue basically asks the question, and I'm just trying to scroll back. My screen has scro scrolled away. <laughs> That's the problem with this. This is the problem with technology. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. All right. Sue says, how do you know the difference between guidance and your imagination? That's a cool question because I like to think that your imagination is your guidance system and we have been given a negative connotation. So our guidance is trying to guide us all the time and we've been given a negative um, image or connotation of that guidance system and we've been told, oh, it's your imagination and so we dismiss it. Actually, your imagination is your soul communicating with you or your higher self or your inner mystic. It does it through your imagination. And here's how to tell whether it is true or, where, <clears throat> or whether it's a voice or whether it's programming coming from outside. So that's what we really want to differentiate between. Our imagination is real, but is it, 
Is it our guidance or is it the conditioning that we have received from the outside, the fear-based conditioning over the years? And that's what you want to differentiate because if you've been conditioned to believe a certain way, that is the voice that pulls you down. It's that same voice that told you, oh, it's your imagination. That is the voice you don't want to listen to. And here's how to differentiate. The voice of conditioning is the voice of fear. The voice of guidance is the voice of love. It's the voice of freedom. It's the voice of passion. So if what you're hearing, what you're feeling, what you're getting, the images, the, the uh, messages, if it's, if it's making you feel passionate, open, free, strong, that is real. That's your higher self. If it's making you feel small, if it's making you fearful, if it's making you dim your light, that is the voice of conditioning. The same goes with teachers to follow, spiritual teachers, self-help books, any of those things. If all those teachings, if they're making you open yourself up to your own power, to your own guidance, your own connection, and they're making you feel free and strong and imaginative, and they're making you feel open, then that is what you follow. But if it's making you fearful, if it's making you feel, oh, if I don't do this, I'll be, I'll, I'll be getting bad karma, I'll be going to hell, and it's curtailing you, and it's making you um, diminish your energy and your spirit, then that's not for you. It's not for you. It doesn't work for you because you are here to be big and to shine your light, and that is your truth, and that's the only truth to follow. So thanks for that question. Aisha says, I love your Himalayan salt lamp. Oh, thank you, Aisha. Hi, Aisha. And happy belated birthday. <laughs> I'm just scrolling through the questions here. There are so many. There are so, so, so many. Oh, my gosh. Okay, we'll do one more. I think um, we're, yeah, we're at 40 minutes in, so let's do one more. All right. I'm just looking here for a question that I know that you can answer in 10 minutes or less. <laughs> I know. I should really get into them. I can't help myself. <laughs> so a quick, short question. And in the interim, what can I say? Uh, you know, even though I love doing these videos, I love meeting you guys more. I love doing live events because we kind of create a special energy with like-minded people. Um, I have started to do more and more retreats, like five day, seven day events, five day retreats. I've, I've got a seven day cruise lined up. And I do that because I like to take you out of your environment. Changes can really happen when you're outside of your environment because sometimes after reading a book or these videos, you're still in your environment. So if you can, if you're able to, please join me on one of my retreats or my cruise. We, we usually have a really, really wonderful time and all we focus on is really uplifting yourself. We focus on healing. We focus on making you feel really good and and we hopefully send you back home feeling a different person. So have we got another question? We have got one last question, and I think that you will enjoy this one. Great. Uh, it's just disappeared off my screen again. <laughs> Sarah Love asks... I love your name. Hi, Sarah Love. How do we know when we should let a relationship go or to keep trying? So here's the thing. If it feels like you are trying, then you are not being honest. So um, here's my litmus test. Are you able to share what you're feeling with your partner? In other words, if you're doing it out of obligation, out of guilt, you wouldn't want your partner to know that, that, oh, I'm still here because I'm just trying. That means it's time to go. If you reversed it in your own head, and felt that your partner was there for the very same reasons you are in that relationship, how would you feel? In other words, if you felt that if you found out that your partner was only there because they're trying, but actually they're kind of thinking, is it time to let go? You would feel awful to find that out. It's more honest to leave if that's the case. And here's how it, it how you really know when you should be in the relationship is when you know that even though it's really hard, 
um, you know that there's nowhere else you want to be except with this person. And I mean, I can tell you this, like, for example, the way I feel right now about my spouse, I know that even if something, and heaven forbid, I don't even like saying this, but even if he were to have a mental condition that made him change and made him an awful position, I would know that this is not him. This is really not him because I know him. I feel I know him so well. This is not who he is. And I would go to any length to help him to get that cure, to go back to being the person I know he truly is. And when I was going through cancer, that's how he felt about me. If it's not that, then it's better to be honest and to evaluate. And your telltale signs are, am I able to express to him how I feel right now? If I'm too ashamed or embarrassed, then I need to evaluate why I'm here. It's dishonest. And the second thing is, if I were to reverse it and realize he was here with me for these reasons that I am feeling, how would I feel? Then it's dishonest to be with them. So that's your litmus test. So thank you for that great question. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, and if you did, please share it with people who you know that it, it can help. Please do. And, um, you know, please check out my YouTube channel for more videos. And I look forward to seeing you again next week on another Facebook Live, on another video. I look forward to reading your comments and I look forward to seeing you at my events. And have a great week ahead. Bye.